and I'm talking about production model deployment today. So I wanted to give a bit of context about why, why this is what I chose to talk about, why I think this is interesting. There we go. Why I think this is interesting. Uh, and this has a lot to do with my background. So when I was an undergrad, I studied math and physics. And I thought the combination of the two was super interesting, particularly in classical mechanics and thinking about gravity. And so when I wanted to go to grad school, I was debating the merits of doing theoretical physics or applied math. And I had a very wise professor who told me I would have a lot more flexibility with opportunities if I went and studied applied math. And the things I was interested in was numerical simulations of physical systems anyway. So same difference in terms of what I would actually be doing in a theoretical physics program or applied math. So I go and I start studying numerical partial differential equations, how to solve them, and pretty quickly I get introduced to ideas from machine learning and dimensionality reduction techniques applied to partial differential equations. And I thought that was amazing. And I got more and more excited about statistics and machine learning and realized that that is a way in which I wanted to apply my mathematical mind. But despite the name applied math, applied math did not feel very applied to me. I frequently would ask questions, why, how would I take this model and actually put it in a system? And so I was in a PhD program and decided to leave and I wanted to go work in industry and figure out how do you deploy a model? What does it mean to deploy a model? How do you actually take this thing that you've built and make it practical and used in a system, right? Mm -hmm. So I went, interviewed a bunch, hate interviewing, and <laughs> I ended up at a tiny startup that at the time was called Odiago and quickly became renamed Weeby Data. Who here has watched Silicon Valley? I lost my mind laughing when I heard the name Aviato because it really reminded me of my first job. <laughs> so Weeby Data ended up being a, a company that built a real-time machine learning platform, particularly for recommendations built on top of Apache HBase. And when they hired me, they were like, well, you kind of know how to code, but you're not a software engineer. We know we want your math skills eventually. How about we pair you up with someone and teach you engineering? And working there and working with my mentor, Keon, was one of the best experiences, especially first experiences in tech I could imagine. So I got to understand what people were doing when they were thinking about certain types of machine learning problems and putting those into systems. I also worked at a, another failed startup, so ne none of these things really exist anymore. That was about three years of my life of lots of learning and interesting projects. And then I decided I should go work at a company that has a name that people might recognize. Uh, there's something like called the halo effect, right, where you work at a company that's successful, people are like, oh, you must have had something to do with it. I don't agree with it, but it's real. <laughs> and so I found myself working at Cloudera, working with some of our big customers, and doing a mix of working on open source projects, doing things like this, going and giving talks, and, cons and doing consulting with big customers about what sort of data science tooling they should have, what it means to integrate that into their business, how they should be deploying different sorts of models. And I'm now a data platform engineer at Stitch Fix. So I'll use this as, example, as an example pretty frequently, so I'm gonna sort of briefly describe what Stitch Fix does. Stitch Fix is a personal styling service. You fill out a survey with your sizes, your preferences, things you like or don't like, and we'll send you a box of five, five items, either on a schedule or on demand. And behind the scenes, we use data absolutely everywhere. We have a recommendation algorithm that feeds what items get shown to stylists that are actually doing the styling for you. So it's a mixture of humans and algorithms. We have algorithm, algorithm algorithmic buying and rebuying. We decide when to clearance items. We have good operational discipline in our warehouses and try to optimize that process. Lots of different things going on here. So the algorithms team at Stitch Fix is more than 100 people. There's about 80 in data science and about 20 or so, maybe 15 in data platform. And I've been working on it very, close, very closely with data scientists building tools for them. Uh, a good example of using Stitch Fix is a frequent question when I give talks while working at Stitch Fix now is, am I wearing Stitch Fix items? So ahead of a bunch of talks I was giving in April, I ordered a fix and I was like, hey, I'm getting ready to give a bunch of talks, send me some things I might want to wear. One of the things I got was this necklace, smart stylist, great. So 
the agenda today is talking a little bit about the model life cycle. So this entire track that I've been speaking in has been split up into what the machine learning model building life cycle looks like. And I'm talking about production deployment, but I want to explain how it fits in because production deployment is a really complicated topic. And once we have an understanding of what the life cycle looks like and what deployment means, at least in the context that I'll be talking about it in, I'm going to talk about some of the deployment challenges. And of course, solutions to those challenges that are themselves very challenging. <laughs> but there's solutions to those too. And those are also pretty hard. <laughs> and so hopefully, the message that you'll take away from this is not that this is too hard to be done, but I'll hopefully give you a framework to ask questions about your production model deployment and help you understand what places to dig in and look. Because there's a huge variety of types of models and types of requirements you have for systems, but there's consistent questions that you can ask across those systems to figure out if you are accurately covering your bases in your deployment. So the life cycle. I like to think of data scientists as black boxes. You put data in, and services and dashboards come out. We're going to focus on <laughs> the process of putting data in and a model coming out. And perhaps, fine, I admit, we won't actually talk about them as black boxes. I just kind of like that as a joke for what they do. Uh, I like to imagine that inside of that mysterious world of model building, it's just a lot of writing on chalkboards and dream of, dreaming about equations. In reality, that's not actually the process. So what we've been talking about today is this whole process of there's a bunch of data, and in a large organization, it'll be inside of a data warehouse. There is some sort of featureization where you're taking this data warehouse and building up enough information for you to apply your models to. You're doing model training. Oh, good. I love mood lighting. <laughs> uh, what, should I go on? Should I stop? Can you maybe have more? Okay. Yeah, no, I feel pretty cozy. This part of the, <laughs> this part of the video is going to be really exciting for people watching. <laughs> so, um, right, you have featureization. You do training where you produce a model. You're then going to apply that model in this sort of batch model building process and do model validation. So fabulous. We've built a model. We're going to deploy it. It's time for liftoff. We're putting this thing in production. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I think of deployment as sharing. You've built some sort of artifact, and you need to share it with other people. So the question is then, in what method will you be sharing this model? I think that there's three types of model deployment mechanisms. One is building a service. So when putting a model inside of an API, you give it some data, it gives you your, your predicted response. So in the case of Stitch Fix recommendations, we might say, here's a client ID, or here's a bunch of information about a client. Tell us what items they might be interested in. You can also share a model by sharing its output written to a file. And so this is an example of something that I had seen in situations where you have really long turnaround times, and it's not important that the model is super reactive. So a good example is a telecom companies. I've seen churn models be put into production by having a reliable pipeline that applies a model in a batch setting and writes out a file of, here's the churn propensity score for each of our customers. And the reason that it, it doesn't really need to be put behind a service is that they basically have a cron job that's going to email people every day or set off some other sort of batch process with the highest churn likelihood customers. And so it's not really important that this is behind a service and being reactive in a web application of any, of any kind. It's more important that there's just a big list that some process can look at. And then the third way, which is probably the least common but still possible, and I've seen it happen, is through a software package. So you can imagine having built a model and putting parameters in it, and then deploying it to some package repository where someone else can download that model and use it. Well, I keep talking about models like it means something. And I think that there's actually a lot of terms in machine learning, data science, AI, <laughs> that are pretty poorly defined. And I think model is one of them. There's lots of contexts we use the phrase model. 
And so when I'm going to be talking about models here and deploying models, what do I actually mean? Well, in the context of this talk, when I say model, I mean it's the thing that, that knows enough about itself to know how to apply itself. So let's say I've trained a linear regression model. And what's happened here is I go from a CSV with a bunch of strings and features and it's not quite in the right format to have regression applied to it yet. There needs to be maybe some encoding of variables or transformations. And then there actually needs to be an application of that trained model, like you've learned all of the weights for your different, co all the weights or different coefficients in your model, and you need to know how to apply that. And so I would say that models are the featureization steps, maybe the type of model, the learned weights, and all of the logic that you need to apply that. So how do you actually take a model and move it from this training process up, up at the top to an application process? So you get a new observation, you then need to apply this model through doing the same sort of featureization you did in your model training steps, and then take the model that you've learned and apply it to the end of that featureization and reply with a response. You move models through serialization. This is perpetually my favorite joke because it's kind of makes my mouth water a little bit, but also makes my teeth hurt just looking at the picture. Um, so serialization ends up being really important. We need some way of transporting this information between two different workflows and processes. When you're applying a model, you're not also simultaneously training it. So what, what can this mean and what is it that we're gonna be doing in serialization to make this reasonable for us? So I said we're gonna focus on one, type of, one of these types of model deployment. We're gonna focus on a, building a service that responds in an API, because this is extremely common, you see it in a ton of companies. You're gonna build a service that's gonna be a model, app, model scoring service. And that determines how we wanna serialize our model and how we wanna serialize our model and what sort of format that serialization takes, because then we, then we need to be able to load it into our service. So I claim we need to do some sort of serialization and then we need to be able to load that serialization in a web server, and that is deployment. It seems easy enough, right? It's mostly a problem of serialization. Well, once you've gotten to the point that you know you've made a model, and you know you need to write it out somewhere and then read it in again, you need to think beyond that simple interface. And so there's three classes of questions that I think we should be asking. So first is, does your model do what you need? Both at a very basic level of, does this thing function? Does this, but then beyond that, does this thing function as you expect it to? When you did your validation offline, you, it seemed effective, but is it actually making you more money now? Is it actually getting you more clicks? Whatever it is you're trying to optimize for. Does it meet your engineering requirements? So this could be things like throughput and latency, common concerns, and is your team actually organized to build and support this type of model? And I think this last question is really interesting because data-driven capabilities at the scale that we're seeing are relatively new in the industry, and I think we're still trying to figure out how to best build teams that know how to build these capabilities and to actually support them. And I think that team structure is very, very inter intertwined with the types of systems that we end up being capable of building, especially when there's so many diverse sets of skills that are required to build these services. So does it function? Well, beyond unit testing where you build a server and you're like, okay, I know how to load the serialized model in some way, you now have the service up. Is it functioning? At the very most basic level, this is the same thing you would do for any other service. You need to make sure that there's logging. You need to make sure that you're doing monitoring on it. Are you having really spiky memory usage? Are you, like, is your CPU, CPU load too high sometimes? Things like that. Relatively simple, straightforward. If you've done any other web service related work, it's the same thing. Set up pager duty, have things alert. There's a question of what exactly you want alerting and when, but pretty straightforward answer to does this thing function? Does it continue to work after you've set it up? 
A more interesting question to ask that's a little more close to the mathematical end of it and the sort of responsive data-driven capability they're trying to provide is, is this thing that you've built actually useful? So there's a quote that's, maybe it's more of an aphorism. It's treated as a quote. People repeat it a lot, but I don't think it was ever quite said succinctly. But the summarization of a lot of things that George Box has said of the famous Box plots is all models are wrong and some are useful. So the question is, we built this model, we serialized it in some format, which I'll talk about. Once we start using it in our systems, is it doing what we need? There's really only one standard best practice way to determine that, and that is to do A-B testing, to do an experiment. And so what happens here is that we split this, we split the things we're making predictions on, so let's say we're making recommendations of clothing between clients and people, uh, between clients and items. We would split our clients into a control group and an experiment group, so two different treatments, and some people would get one set of recommendations, and other people would get a different set, and we would compare those two to see if there's a statistical difference. That's all well and good. There are standard ways to go about doing that. That's absolutely something that every company that I've heard of that treats machine learning in a serious way does before they roll out a new model. What about forever, right? A-B testing is good. You take this model, you put it into production. Do you leave it there for a month and just wait to see if PagerDuty rings and figure it's kind of working all right? I think there's this interesting long-term view of model quality that is pretty hard to approach, I think. So if you think about it as A-B testing, you could say, well, if we want to see if this model continues to do as well as it did at, during the A-B test into the future, what we do is we run this A-B test forever. We never stop. Someone is always, some population is always in a control group. And this is something that you can do, and I've heard of companies doing this. So if you are on an app and it never changes and all of your friends have a different one, this might be happening to you, you might be the control. <laughs> Um, but it's also relatively uncommon because when there's product managers or product-minded people around, they're pretty hesitant to say that there's going to be some group of users that never see any changes. Because if you think you're actually improving the quality of what you're building, you want people to be able to see that, to use that. So permanent in infinite A-B test is a possibility. It happens sometimes. But <laughs> there are maybe other things that you can do to look at your model in production and see if it's actually doing what you need it to do. So you can look at things like distributions of features, distributions of predictions. And these might change based on the population coming in changing, but it gives you some sense of what might be going on in the model and some sort of way to catch and debug things in production. What is maybe, what is maybe useful in thinking about this is measuring things that tell you how often you need to refresh your model. So you can imagine that instead of building a single model that you then throw into production and is there forever, what you actually need to, to determine is figure out how frequently you need to, to rebuild these models. So I would claim that when you deploy a machine learning model into production, you're not actually saying, I have built one model. It is the best model. This model is now the thing that is in production and we shall use it forever. More likely, deploying a model into production means deploying the entire pipeline of model building and making that much more repeatable and rigorous. So in the case of recommendations at Stitch Fix, which again, I said I'm just gonna repeat over and over as my example, uh, we have new clients coming in every day and we have new items coming in every day. And so it's useful for us to rebuild our recommendation models on a daily basis because we need to include both of those in them. There might be other reasons you want to be rebuilding your models. You get more information about behavior and more information that goes into your density estimates that are, that are feeding into your machine learning models. So would you mind uh, holding it to the end of the talk? Thank you. Um, so when you deploy a model, you are deploying, you are deploying pipelines. You're not necessarily deploying that single model that you've actually made. So 
this pipeline, you need to set up in some sort of schedule. You need to figure out what that schedule is. And so going back to this, does this model continue to be useful question, I think useful things to begin to monitor here that feed into how frequently you rebuild your model and how regularly you need this pipeline to run is very related to how you get shift in your estimated features, in your estimated predictions. And so that's one way you can begin to debug or answer the question of how frequently does this model need to be retrained. I've definitely seen daily, I've seen weekly, I've seen monthly. In some cases, I've seen never because people have forgotten how they built the model in the first place, which is a fascinating and real thing that happens. So deploying a machine learning model into production means deploying the entire pipeline and building this, the whole, like every piece of the step, hopefully doing some validation still at the end to catch if you somehow introduce a bug or there's something weird happening in the data, and then you get a new serialized model that goes into your systems. So when are you doing this? I would say you can do this on some regular cadence, and I talk about nightly because that's extremely common, but think of nightly as any type of regular cadence, so it's a cron job that rebuilds your models. Or you could be doing this continuously, and these are two very different modes of model deployment. So when you're doing something on a regular schedule, every night or every six hours, you're essentially using cron or some sort of time-based system. Um, lots of data scientists don't like using cron because it's not that fun to use. And also, these machine learning pipelines end up being really complicated. There's multiple steps, you get fan out, fan in, and to, to work on this, to have an easier interface for these complex model building pipelines, people have developed tools. So in the past, I've used Uzi, Luigi was popular for a while, Airflow seems to be popular now. These are tools for orchestrating complex pipelines and then scheduling them to run on a regular basis. Oh. So this is missing its title, but what this is a representation of is the Lambda architecture. And so this is an example of how you can continuously train your model. I don't want to discuss this in detail, but I do want to show you the drawing because you can see that there's a lot going on in this picture. So what is happening here is that the Lambda architecture provides a framework for thinking about how to take in data about your client behavior, about your user behavior, and update model parameters as new information comes in and use that continuously updated model to apply to whatever predictions you're trying to make. And so you can, you can think of this as, uh, as keeping partial estimates of the entire model and updating those continuously. So it's possible to do this, but as you can see, it is more complicated than running an ETL pipeline you're familiar with every night. So if we know that it does what we want it to, it runs, it's accurate, do we actually know that it meets our requirements? So this gets into the what are our engineering requirements and what are we actually aiming to optimize? I think frequently people don't take a step back and ask themselves what are the things that are hard about this, what do we actually need to optimize for, and they can get pretty astray <laughs> in what they're focusing on. And so I strongly recommend before you think about building a machine learning model, asking yourself what kind of latency requirements do you have? How fast does this model need to be applied? What kind of throughput is required? And do you need a system that is built nightly? Or does the freshness of the model really need to be baked into the way that you're applying the model itself? So something like the Lambda architecture. An example of a system that needed something like this, where it's continuously updating its own model, is Google News. So there's a really great paper called Google News Scalable Online Personalization, I believe, and they talk about the system that they built and why they needed it. So news articles are coming in quickly, and they need to be able to incorporate new news, ar news articles into their systems. And as people are clicking around and looking at different items, they need to be able to surface rising stories. And so that's very time constrained. And they need to be able to incorporate those new articles into their systems quickly. So they needed something that has 
intense latency requirements in terms of updating the model itself, not in terms of just model application. So taking a step back before you ever dig into thinking about building a data-driven capability and building these types of systems helps you focus on what it is you need to do. So throughput. If you have a relatively simple model, meaning a stateless model, you've serialized some, some like linear regression model, you have a server that knows how to load that serialized regression model and apply it to new data, it's relatively easy to have that account for higher throughput. What we do at Stitch Fix is we put, things behind, we put these models behind a load balancer and we just add more instances. Beautiful, wonderful, simple. Uh, and a lot of the way that our serializ serialization works currently is that this state store is something that's being read by the server every time it's, that state store itself is updated. So this is, you can imagine as a database of parameters for models. So let's say you wanna deploy a new regression model. You say, hey, my regression model name is blank. And these are the features that I'm using. Here are the weights for them. And then in the server, the servers know how to reload based on new data there, update the parameters that are being used in during model application, and we can just add as many servers as we need if there's a lot of need for it. If you have something more complicated, so not these relatively stateless servers, um, something more like this Lambda architecture or something like Google News made, the question of throughput is a lot more complicated. I don't feel the need to talk about it right now, but there are, there are huge trade-offs in working with a system like this or deciding that that's the type of system that you need. Then the question is, okay, sure, is your model fast enough? Having a goal ahead of time before you start optimizing it to make it the fa as fast as possible is absolutely a great idea. Otherwise, you can go indefinitely in optimizations that get you relatively little. One approach for making your models faster is to use approximation methods and different tricks. So there are things like hashing tricks and the dimensionality reduction projection tricks, seeing the shadow of a data set and building your model off that instead, and we're generally working with smaller data at application time. Um, those are interesting but specialized and seeing the patterns of how those map to certain types of problems and certain types of models are again beyond the scope of this talk. Well, there are also other relatively straightforward ways to make things faster. One is materializing data that you need at application time. So a really, really common technique is to have something called a feature store, where when we said we were taking that section of the model pipeline where we do featureization and model applica application, and that was gonna be the thing that we serialized and deployed into production, we can think of splitting what we're deploying into production is two things. There's a featureization step and a model application step. Featureization, if let's say the only thing that we're getting in is a client ID or a user ID, if what we needed to do was go out to a database and join together a bunch of tables to get all of the information about a user and then do some processing to get it to the point that it now looks like a feature vector and apply our model to it, that could be extremely slow. You can think of a feature store as pre-materializing the feature information for a user or a client so that once you get a new client ID, you don't have to do a bunch of computation. You can just look up what features are associated with your model and then take your model and the parameters that you've learned and apply it. Of course, this itself is challenging because you could have a feature store that is out of sync with your model. You need to be pretty careful about deploying these two things and having the two things match up in terms of what version of it you're using. You could imagine that you change the type of model that you're using, but you still look up the data that you used in different model training steps. So that's a bug that I have seen happen before. So this is a solution to latency problems, but it comes with its own challenges. Another way to do this is to materialize model output ahead of time. So thinking back to the churn example, if you have not huge numbers of customers and you want to be able to predict churn based on features that are not changing very quickly, every night you could just run, uh, you could just run a job 
that outputs the predictions to a file and then once you, or, or to a database, and then once you need the prediction, you look up what that is. This is extremely fast. The challenge here is it only really works with problems that have bounded domains and are not extremely responsive to new inputs. So if what you need is that person and what time of day it is right now to get to your prediction, then this is not a system that will work for you or not a sort of trick for speeding things up that will actually function adequately. And the evergreen solution to speeding things up. Here's what we'll do. We'll take the model and we'll rewrite it in C. <laughs> um, this is actually extremely common. So, there we go. This is extremely common. When I was working at Cloudera with a lot of different companies and seeing how their systems work and how they're integrating data science into their businesses, frequently there would be a team of data scientists that would build some kind of model that they wanted to put into production. And then once they had the model that was ready, they would take it to a bunch of engineers and say, hey, built this thing, it's your job to go implement it now. This has the potential to be straightforward and fast, but instead what I've seen is that the handoff, this process of taking a team of engineers and having a team of engineers and one data scientist, having a strong split between them results in a really, really slow process and a really error prone process. So, Frequently, an engineer will sit down for an hour, talk about this model that's been built, think they understand it, go off and code it, you come back a week later, and the predictions are different. Why? Great question. <laughs> you feel like you're in a comfortable place, but you're a little bit stuck. And so predictions being different, not being able to actually implement the model as it's specified, also extremely common. And this, I think, then gets to the, the point that I brought up about data science being a pretty new field and people not quite understanding what it means to have a certain structure of a team and how that then translates into the software that they build. So Conway's law is accurate and just once I learned it, I started seeing it everywhere, which I think is a type of bias, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, the way it's stated is that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. So thinking back to having a team where you have software engineers that are split off from data scientists, you, need, you necessarily need this handoff where there's model building on one side and model deployment on the other side. So typical data science departments look something like this. We have data engineers that produce features for data scientists. Data scientists produce models for software engineers. And then data infrastructure engineers are providing infrastructure that all of them use. So for a certain data-driven capability, building recommendation engine or fraud detection, you have all of these people with different skill sets working together but not necessarily on the same parts of it, right? Data scientists are responsible for model building. Somehow that gets handed off to data engineers. This is something that actually makes a lot of sense if you have an architecture as complex as a Lambda architecture. You need a lot of skill in machine learning and in building complex services and using different types of data systems for communication to build a system that looks like this. And so, that is, so what I'm about to say about the way Stitch Fix that does things does not necessarily relate to this, right? Like we're never building systems that look like, the, look like a Lambda architecture. And there are certain cases where this kind of tightly coupled team and maybe a little bit of, hopefully not too much handoff, but the type of machine learning experience that you need to sort of work in this team tends to be very engineering heavy. And so tightly coupled teams can work for systems like this but it's also hard, expensive, slow. There's a lot of communication that needs to happen. And so this whole process of building a model, having some sort of serialized version of it, 
and then actually having a thing in production that makes it needs to be owned by the same team and sort of couples together. So that makes sense. Fixing model handoff in the Lambda architecture case means hiring data scientists with the right skills and having them work very closely and be strong in engineering, work closely with engineers to build something that's complex like that kind of system. Another way to think about it is what if the models that you're building and the models you need to deploy are not nearly as complex? What are the requirements that you have? Can you have data scientists own these capabilities end to end? And so this is one of the interesting things that I think about in my job where I build tools for data scientists that Stitch Fix to use for building their models and deploying their models into production is what if data scientists own a capability? So capability A is merchandising. Capability B is matching stylists to fixes and people that they're going to style. Capability C is matching clients to items and how that shows up in our internal styling application. And when I think about that, I try to think about it in terms of clean interfaces between different steps of their process. So again, what we're interested in here is the serialized model. So we have some sort of process that is generating our model, and we need to take our model and turn it into a system that knows how to apply it. And so having a clean interface there ends up being very important. There's a few different ways you can think about this, right? So I said we need some sort of serialization. Standard forms of any type of serialization, you know, JSON, XML, text-based serialization, there are things that exist that can output that for models. Of course, you want something on the other side that knows how to read XML and JSON and apply it. And then there's also more custom serialization. So who here has used scikit-learn to build models? Yeah, exactly. So scikit-learn, one of the ways you can do model serialization, and in fact, the way that they recommend it on their, internal, on their documentation, is using Pickle, or particularly Joblib and Pickle, to serialize models so that you have the entire pipeline that you've, your scikit-learn pipeline that you've specified, and the learned parameters stuffed into a binary file that you can then load later in a different process during serving. So there exist open standards for these text-based serialization formats. There's a thing called PMML, Predictive Modeling Markup Language. This is an XML format for specifying your model pipelines and the type of model you're using and the, and the learned weights that you're using in the model. And to go along with that, there are, the there are the scoring sides of these things. So there's a pretty cool system called open scoring, which is a pretty easy to use web server that uses a JPMML, so a Java-based PMML scoring, uh, scoring library to allow you to deploy models and then apply models to data coming in. So what this ends up looking like is that your model training pipelines output a serialized model in PMML format. And then open scoring, which is a Java-based web server, it's relatively easy to deploy, it has a REST API that's defined over here, can be used to do your application of featureization and your application of model parameters to any new data that you have coming in. So this is actually a pretty great tool set there's lots of libraries that know how to, that do model training that know how to output models in PMML. One of the drawbacks, and the main one that I hear pointed out about PMML, is that there are limited choices for the types of models it supports. And there's actually, so this link I give at the bottom here is PMML related libraries and what model types they support. And in this case, this is for open scoring the REST API, what models can it score with. Beyond just the limitations of open scoring or other systems like this, there's some limitations in what PMML can describe in the featureization pipelines. So it can be a little bit brittle and is not nearly as flexible as something like scikit-learn pipelines. So another way to do this is to take your Take your, infrastructure, your model training infrastructure and think about your serialized model as data and decouple it entire, almost entirely from this metadata around it that says 
this is my model that is this type. This is a decision tree. This is a regression model. And instead, just write the parameters out somewhere. And then assume that you have written in your, your service that is actually applying this model the logic that correctly maps together the parameters to the actual model you're trying to apply. This is the most common thing that I see everywhere. There are obvious drawbacks. You can easily get out of sync in the model that you think you're applying in the service and the model that you're actually writing data to in the data store that you're reading from. But it works and people seem to use it. So the, the general questions that I try to ask when I'm thinking about the types of problems that happen when trying to build production model deployment schemes is first, does the model do the thing that it's supposed to do? Does the service itself function and do you know how to monitor for it? Is it useful? Do you do A-B testing? Does that work? Like, did it actually help your business make more money or have more clicks? And can you answer both of those questions about functionality of the service and the usefulness of the service continuously through time? Which itself relates back to logging and monitoring in these systems. And then does it meet your requirements? So hopefully you, know, you decided ahead of time I'm going to specify what requirements I have for this system. And you have these numbers in mind. Does, does it meet that? And more, <laughs> the most interesting to me is, is the team organized in such a way that you can actually support the systems that you need to build? And have you optimized your team and your systems for what it is you're hiring for? So if you're building a complex system, Lambda architecture needs to be super fast and near real time, then the way that you would structure that team is probably ML engineers working really closely with other software engineers. If you're building something that has less latency requirements, less throughput, throughput requirements, can you get tools and systems that gets engineers out of the way so there's less handoff and there's no one that says, like, here's my model, I'm done, please rewrite this in C. So thank you. That's what I have to say about production model deployment. I guess we had a question over here to begin with. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your patience with me as I kept going. Uh, so you were mentioning something about rebuilding a model, mm -hmm. like uh, once in a while. What exactly it means? It means to train the mo model from the scratch using all the data, including the previous or just the most recent data, or can you go more in detail in this? Yeah, sure. Place? I think it, it really depends on the model. Um, some models want the most recent view of the world. So maybe you only want to train a model on users that have been active in the last 12 months on your system. And so if you do that weekly, the users that meet that condition will change. And so sometimes you want to retrain your model on the most recent snapshot. Sometimes you want as much history as possible. And there's no correct answer. It's really dependent on what use case. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Any at all? Let's see if there's any online then okay. through the app. Oh, while he reads, I'm happy to pitch that Stitch Fix <laughs> is always hiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody asked through the app if you mainly use standard machine learning models or if you use any uh, deep learning models for your work at Stitch Fix. So most models Depends what you mean by deep learning. <laughs> um, most models are standard in some sense, like they exist in libraries somewhere. I think my, my definition of standard is this thing exists in a library and I can just use it. There are, there's some experiments with AI tools and bigger models. Um, most of the AI tools work is around factorization machines and low dimensional embeddings coming out of factorization machines. I think there's been a little bit of computer vision with deep learning to do color identification on clothing, which is actually pretty hard. Um, we have our merchandisers, so the people that determine what items we're gonna buy, label like, oh, this shirt is, well, that's probably a bad example, I'm wearing solid colors, but like, someone with a pattern. <laughs> the gentleman in the back in the plaid with the red. <laughs> uh, he's wearing a red plaid shirt. Uh, is his shirt 
red or a slightly different shade of red or this off-white color. Uh, you probably want to actually capture what percentage of different colors are in there and maybe even the pattern. And so being able to automatically get computer understandable information out of images that we have of merchandise ends up being an interesting, more complex deep learning neural network kind of model. Cool. Then uh, please remember to rate this session and uh, thanks for now. <laughs>